But once we knew that that mass was located at the center, this gave us our, our more modern picture of what the atom looks like. The, the so-called plum pudding model, which Thompson had put forth after doing his, uh, elect his Thompson tube experiments and so forth, in which protons and electrons were uniformly scattered throughout the atom, that was abandoned right after this experiment began because the experiment certainly would not support this type of model. Instead, the model that came into being was the so-called planetary model, where electrons were in orbit around a nucleus, again, a very small nucleus as far as volume, where all the mass, or the majority certainly, of the mass was in the atom. And of course, the analogy is obvious that this was such an appealing analogy because it was like planets uh, in orbit around the sun in a solar system. Now, the only problem with this model, as we'll find out, is it turns out that the electrons are not in orbit, but we have to have a very different understanding of what those electrons are doing. Nonetheless, as far as the locations of the electrons, they're occupying a volume much, much more massive than the volume of the nucleus. That certainly is true. And so again, that's this fundamental paradigm shift that was brought about by the uh, Rutherford experiment. Now, there was still one missing piece. We knew about protons, we knew about electrons, we knew that there was mass not accounted for by the protons in the nucleus, in atoms. And indeed, many had postulated the existence of a neutral particle having about the same mass as a proton, but there was no direct evidence for these so-called neutrons because remember how we measure, or again, at the, at the time, how people measured particles was they'd accelerate them in an electric field, watch them bend and figure out how big they had to be. And the problem was neutrons had no charge. So what are you gonna do? You can't see the darn things. You can't accelerate them and bend them anywhere. So it took another, another 20 years beyond the Rutherford experiment before Chadwick devised an experiment that ultimately found the first direct existence of neutrons. Now, the idea was to take these, again, these wonderful alpha particles, these miniature sledgehammers, and direct them into a film of beryllium. Now, by the way, there's, there's, there's no way that he had the foresight to know beryllium would be the magic thing that would give rise to neutrons. Um, but you got to understand, at the time, people were aiming alpha particles at everything they could find. And beryllium just happened to be the material, or one of the materials, that would give rise to these neutrons. The neutrons couldn't be detected, but what you could do was scatter nitrogen atoms, or other atoms, in this case the experiment was done with nitrogen, um, much in the way a billiard ball bounces off another billiard ball, the neutrons were being emitted out of the beryllium. They were being kicked out by the alpha particles, and those neutrons would bounce off nitrogen atoms. In the process of the collision, the nitrogen would be ionized. It would lose an electron, and so then you'd have a charged particle um, that would be flying off, and by looking at how fast that nitrogen was traveling, you could figure out something about this neutron being massive and also being neutral in that you couldn't detect the neutron directly. And so this was, again, the direct observation, the first direct observation of the existence of neutrons. And then by just accepting that, OK, neutrons do exist, we do have these neutral particles then, you could figure out what the mass of the neutron was by knowing mass of the proton and knowing the mass of an entire atom that would contain both the protons and the neutrons and the electrons. So the neutrons, again, was that missing mass. So that pretty much completed our picture, our, our more modern understanding of what an atom is, which is, once again, protons and neutrons clustered very tightly together in a very small volume at the center of the atom, at the nucleus, with electrons occupying a volume around it, a much, much larger volume, again, than the volume of the nucleus. And again, it's so appealing to think of these electrons in orbit somehow around that nucleus, and we'll find out that that's not quite right, but at least it's a starting point for us. So finally, let's return once again to Dalton. We find that Dalton, although he didn't get it completely right, was pretty close to the right idea. All matter is composed of indivisible atoms. That's true as long as we're in the realm of chemical reactions, that the atoms are, in fact, 
maintained, but we do know that atoms, in fact, can be divided. They can be divided into protons and neutrons, and that becomes the realm of nuclear reactions then when we're talking about that. Okay, element is a type of matter composed of one type of atom with characteristic mass. Eh, that turns out not to be right because you can change the number of neutrons without affecting its overall charge at the nucleus. We'll talk much more about that soon. But it is true a compound is composed of atoms of different types. Chemical reactions involve rearranging those atoms of different types. And so Dalton, again, although he didn't have it perfectly, really did an enormous amount, a huge contribution into helping change the way we think about our microscopic world.